this is the most unique. It's the unique, the most unique for many reasons, uh, some of which I, I spoke about already this morning, including the size of it. Um, but most importantly, it's because of this pavilion, in my, in my opinion, because the world is a religious world. But also, I think what defines uh, almost anything that happens in the UAE, and I think it's the case here too, is uh, this is a cop that is, by its orientation, dedicated towards action, not just reassuring words and good intentions. And so I'm going to take my, my brief time here and talk about uh, two challenges and two, two opportunities we face in order to hand a better world, a cleaner world, a more sustainable world, a more beautiful world uh, to our children. So, so here are the challenges. No surprise. Polarization and politicization. The, the truth is these are the dual threats on most fronts, the most issues that concern people in the world, including in this in this room, but especially on this, on this front. We're living in a world of intensified polarization fueled by the weaponization of words. And one of the byproducts of this polarization is the fortification of ideological and political silos. Polarization gives oxygen to the extremes. It sabotages, sabotages compromise. It obscures the truth even for those who sincerely seek it. And in this digital age, it's more easy to be polarized than ever, ever before. We're, we're given this opportunity to self-select from the vast trove of information available to us. And we generally select the people that we agree with and those that we like to hear it from. We like what we want to hear only to have more information automatically curated from us by advertisers online, by algorithms, sometimes that hunt our children on social media. And on top of it, we block those that we disagree with. Uh, you literally ban them online. And life ends up becoming one grand exercise in listening to or preaching to our individual choirs. Eventually, we hardly know anyone different from us as these algorithms get ingested in our culture itself. And this is not a good formula for solving our most complex problems in a diverse world. Even good solutions, reasonable solutions, are obscured if they come from the other side, whatever the other side is. In my country, uh, there's no issue that's more polarized and more politicized than this one. And whatever the issue, in order to address polarization and politicization, we have to, with intentionality, build a bigger tent. We have to invite more stakeholders. We have to welcome more diverse points of view. We must work to create on-ramps for non-traditional actors, for non-traditional approaches, for non-traditional ideas to be a part of these conversations. But on-ramping these additional stakeholders, it isn't easy because they're joining a movement in progress. They're joining a conversation that's already taking place. It's like showing up as a stranger to a party of friends where everyone knows everyone's story. But the first thing that has to happen is the invitation has to be, has to be issued and then they have to be welcomed and then they have to be engaged with until they can meaningfully contribute. And then they have to have permission to be different until chemistry is, is created in the group. But it's worth it because this is how trust is built and trust is the most valuable commodity in our world. The most valuable commodity in the Middle East, despite all the markets, is not oil or gas. It's trust. There's no business without trust. The, the problems that we're all trying to solve here, none of it happens without, without trust. And among these, constituencies that have to be engaged in order to solve these problems, I would argue that there is simply not a more important constituency than communities of faith because they are everywhere. But as an American and as a, a traditional evangelical Christian, I come from a community that fits into this non-traditional stakeholder category on these issues. Our community is sometimes skeptical of global meetings like this one to begin with. There's a trust deficit. And by, by the way, I often, I often meet people who've never met a genuine, normal, evangelical, evangelical Christian, which is remarkable because there are at least 600 million of us around the world. There probably are as many as 800 million uh, if you account um, uh, unofficial churches in countries like, like China. Our community in the United States alone represents one-third of the electorate. It's probably the largest voting bloc. 80% of them vote for Republicans. We contribute tens of billions of dollars to the U.S. economy alone, just our, our community. Our two largest universities in America are both evangelical schools. Right now, they have 250,000 students enrolled this semester. 
Yet some may be surprised to learn that Section 8 of a long-standing public policy document that represents the consensus view of the National Association of Evangelicals on whose board I served until I, I termed out, it says in part in a section entitled Caring for God's Creation, these words, literally this is what it says, we are called as followers of Jesus to embrace and act responsibly to care for God's earth while we affirm the important truth that we worship only the creator and not the creation. God gave us care of his earth and its species to our first parents. That responsibility is passed on to our hands. We affirm that God-given dominion is a sacred responsibility to steward the earth and not a license to abuse creation, which we are a part. We're not the owners of creation. Rather, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Christians acknowledge creation care as an act of discipleship. We are stewards of the earth, sermon, summoned by God to work it and take care of it. So therefore, we urge Christians in their personal lives and within their communities to live in creation-friendly ways. That's what the document says for the NAE. Mainstream evangelicals, especially American evangelicals, aren't always widely represented in gatherings like, like this one. But simply put, these goals cannot be accomplished without engaging the second or third largest Christian community in the world and a third of the American electorate. So how do we, uh, what, what are the opportunities? And here they are. The first one is to think about localization, not just globalization. While globalization brings us together as, as leaders, localization is required for true impact. The decisions made in forums like COP28 have a significant impact on everyone living in our world, whatever their politics or individual nuanced views may be. But everyone in the world isn't always represented, and that diminishes trust. There is, in fact, a type of virtuous nationalism, a virtuous nationalism, that should be welcomed in international gatherings where standing together doesn't require forsaking your individual identity. International institutions, after all, they exist to serve nations, not to supersede them, to bring them together. It is the difference between interfaith work and multi-faith work in, in, in the world that a lot of us live in. In multi-faith work, you, you don't have to lay aside your sincerely held beliefs in order to collaborate with, with others. Sometimes in interfaith work, that is the expectation. When environments like this, we come together as proud nations, working together as other proud nations in order to do what's best for our local community because change starts at the local level. And if you're thinking about localization, there is no more powerful vehicle, there's no better investment than to, to localize any issue than communities of faith. There's nothing like it. Trust is the currency of faith. When people are in need, they go to their pastor, their priest, their rabbi, their monk, their guru, their imam. As I said this morning, I can take you to thousands of communities all around the world that don't have a Starbucks or McDonald's, but they have a place of worship. And they, the pastor, the imam, the rabbi, they go to as a trusted advisor in every part of their lives, and they know their names in those communities. So there's no shorter path to the change that everyone imagines here than faith. And finally, uh, my last point, the opportunity is, I believe a vision of a brilliant future is far more motivational than fear. I don't mean to diminish the seriousness of this, of this important conversation. It's, it's why I came all the way from the United States to be here. But it does seem to me, as an evangelical, I, I know something about this, it does seem to me that sometimes our rhetoric makes it feel to certain people of faith that you have to change your religion in order to join in order to join this team. It's a, it's a bit apocalyptic sometimes. And I understand why, and I, I, don't, I don't diminish it. There's a time to speak with urgency, but there's also immense power in painting a vision of opportunity. The world needs to be convinced that not only is, are these the right things to do, but they're the best things to do. Visions of opportunity is what animated what has been unprecedented prosperity of the last century that despite its many, many flaws brought more people out of poverty than at any point in human history by orders of magnitude. Embracing a vision of a brilliant future over one plagued with dread borrows from the genius of Silicon Valley, where I'm from. It welcomes our great global corporations as partners in innovation rather than simply as investors. 
A vision of a brilliant future opens up the aperture for not yet imagined possibilities. It is energizing to this conversation. Christians believe that human beings are made in the image of God. And embracing a brilliant vision for the future taps into that creative part of the image of God. The magic that took man to the moon, that cracked the human genome, that imagined the internet, and that is realizing artificial intelligence before our very eyes. We need guidelines. We need goals as guardrails for sure. But history reminds us that prescriptive solutions often fail. And they don't just fail because of a lack of resources or a lack of motivation or a lack of buy-in or just rhetoric. They don't just fail because of black swans like pandemics or war. Prescriptive solutions sometimes fail for a different reason. They fail for a lack of imagination because human beings are creators. Innovation is in our nature. We're never more of a compliment to God than when we create. But when you invite the creatives, as I finish up here, the mad scientist, the culture shapers, the technologist, the rebels, the geniuses, the ambitious, naive young people, the religious people. You also are welcoming diversity. And it may mean that you have climate activists warning of the apocalypse, commingling with climate agnostics who just really just want to drink clean water and breathe clean air and enjoy clean oceans with their children and they drive an electric car because they just think it's cool and it's a little cheaper and it's a better product than the rest. And that's okay too. In fact, you only know you're doing this right when everyone starts to feel a little uncomfortable with the other people in the room. Always people with the right disposition, of course. You'll know you'll get it right when all of the big meetings taking place between the leaders of the world when they start chittering and ch chatting about how the sidelines with the plain spoken regular folk were those that had the most impact on their countries and their institutions. And by the way, here's the uncomfortable part. It also welcomes diverse motivations, but that's okay too. Like in a, in a soccer match, some come to the game because they're fans, zealously so. Others come because it's their hobby, Others study the game. Some just report on it. Others want to profit from the enterprise. But they're all there. They're all in the game. They're all stakeholders. But none of this will happen without intentionality, without creating on-ramps for new communities. And it cannot be a symbolic exercise in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Addressing polarization and politicization requires localization, not just globalization, and a brilliant future a brilliant vision of the future is more powerful than all the fear in the world. And here's the secret that you've discovered at this faith pavilion. It's all made easier when faith isn't a part of the conversation, but at the heart of it. And so these are all reasons why I, I believe this is the cop where the tent is being expanded in all of its forms. Otherwise, you'll just need to set more modest goals. But of course, as I said uh, this morning, we're in the UAE. This is not a land of modest goals. It's the home of the dreamers in our world, and it is the best place for the first faith pavilion. And that's what I have to say. Wow, thank you. Thank you for firing the chat. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, and I, I, I love, uh, well, I love the entire thing, but I, I, I love two things in particular. Glocalization, which is the global and the local, and this is why.